This is the most sacred night upon which our Lord Jesus Christ passed from death to life. By his resurrection, the world passes from the darkness of sin and death into the light of new life in Christ. The image of light from darkness is an ancient one, as old as the world itself. In the beginning, the earth was a formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. The first of God's created order was that of light, the first to be called good. Thus, the separation of light from darkness became an apt image for the resurrection. At the Exodus, God appeared in cloud and in fire, light, protecting his people as he caused them to pass through the waters out of slavery into freedom. At this time, God's presence remained with his people, first at the the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and then later at the temple. And he there instructed his people to keep lamps lit day and night as a sign of his perpetual presence. And so we too keep our sanctuary lamps lit, marking Jesus' real presence in the tabernacle. Though when you arrive tonight, perhaps you notice that the usual red glow to be missing. You see, from the end of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the main tabernacle has been empty. The lamp extinguished, marking the death of our Savior. This night of his resurrection is marked by the enkindling of the new Easter fire the symbol of his rising to new life, from which, after the celebration of tonight's Eucharist, the sanctuary lamps will be relit. The form of the opening of tonight's vigil is found already in the very early life of the church. It's seen in an account in the 300s in Jerusalem. It reveals a practice of of bringing a single candle, single lit candle brought out from the empty tomb of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, from which a multitude of lamps are lit throughout the basilica. And so today's service of light, the blessing, the fire, and of the Easter candle, the procession with the light of Christ, come from a fusion of various variants of the original lucenario as they have been developed by different churches. The Sung Easter proclamation, then, it is made while we hold our lit candles. This, too, was composed no later than the 7th century in portions even to the 4th. It's proclaimed like that of a gospel, the good news, most properly by deacon or priest, venerated with incense and with the greeting, the Lord be with you. The priest or deacon, clothed in white, represents the angel at the tomb. In dazzling garments, announcing the good news, the gospel. He is risen, as he said. The first words of the proclamation, exalt, rejoice, allude to the message of the angels again at Jesus' birth. The glad tidings of great joy, which we again sung as part of the Gloria, with the bells rung and the altar's candles lit. Tomorrow, this joy will be expressed through the great Hallel Psalm 118, used for centuries at the Jewish Passover. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And so in anticipation of that psalm tomorrow, the exalted tonight repeats again and again the solemn declaration, This is the night. This is the night. Seven times repeats this, the number of perfection. The angels, the whole earth, the entire church, our own building here, each of us as individuals, ourselves as ministers, all of us are called to lift our voices in prayer and praise. Why? For the work of redemption has been accomplished.
The price of Adam's sin has been paid by Christ's own dear blood. This is the night that fulfills all of the Old Testament types of the Exodus, the Passover meal, the crossing of the Red Sea, the journey in the desert to the Promised Land. It fulfills, too, the words of Psalm 139, that the night will be as bright as day, dazzling as the night for me, and full of gladness. In this proclamation, we hear the, the ultimate motive for Christ's Paschal mystery. O wonder of your humble care for us, O love, O charity beyond all telling, to ransom a slave, you gave away your son. See, Christ has done this for no other reason than an overflow of love for you and I. The effects of this night are stated, too, in this proclamation of being buried with Christ in baptism, as Paul says in the second reading. The effects are, again, sevenfold. It banishes crime. It washes away sin, restores innocence to those who have fallen, brings gladness to those that are sad, drives forth hate, brings peace, and humbles the proud. With these effects, we see how the light of Christ into many flames divided, is not dimmed by the sharing of his light, but can ignite in our hearts the newness of life. The exalted concludes asking for the grace that this flame of God's life be found still burning within each of us at the final rising of the morning star, Christ's second coming in his glory that with his grace we might persevere undimmed throughout this life to join Christ in the resurrection to life eternal. O truly blessed 